What's happening, everybody? On today's show, the latest news going on around the conference as fall camps continue on. We'll give you takeaways from AM, Kentucky, Alabama, and Auburn. A big recruiting weekend brings some big gets for Georgia, LSU, Bama, and more. And the latest on conference realignment around the college football world. I'll tell you why I'm not the biggest fan of what's going on. Locked on SEC starts right now. You are locked on SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's happening, everybody? Welcome into Locked On SEC. It's great to have you guys along. I'm Chris Gordy. Thanks for making Locked On SEC your first listen every day. Remember, we're free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network covering your team every day. All right, we got plenty to jump into. Camp updates from the weekend. Let's go around the conference. Boots out to the right. Makes the handoff. Throws inside of the ball. Around the conference. And we start over at Alabama as their new offensive coordinator, Tommy Reese, spoke with the media on Monday and talking about the offense that Alabama has run in recent seasons. Tommy Reese dismissing the idea that they're going to make quote unquote wholesale changes. He said that, uh, or he described it as him learning Alabama's system. Uh, this is something we talked with Jay Crane about last week. He said, first of all, I think it's the right way to do it. There's been a system in place here for however many years. Players here that are familiar with the terminology, with what you're trying to accomplish, to say one guy is going to come in here and change everything will be the wrong way to approach it. To come in here and say we're going to change all these things would be foolish. There are certain things we want to do or alter or look at to enhance it, but a wholesale change would never make sense. When asked about implementing his own offense, Tim, uh, Tommy Reese said, look, I do think we're probably going to look different than where I've been elsewhere because our personnel is different. There's different strengths, different areas that we can take advantage of. We don't have a system or I don't have a system that says, hey, you have to fit in these squares. It's more about how can I fit what you do and what you really do well and enhance in our offense. So it's interesting. Tommy Reese kind of saying he came in and learned Bama's way of doing things. Of course, he'll call the plays, but almost sounds a little bit more like this is – Saban's offense, what Saban wants to do, and Tommy Reese, you go execute it. Not a surprise there. Like I said, we talked to Jay Crane a lot about that last week of Crane and Company and uh, kind of resonates the same thought process there. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, Kevin Steele back at Alabama. He spoke at the podium on Sunday, and he was asked about the Alabama standard. He said that has not changed. He said this process is built. It started in 07. I was here. It hasn't gone anywhere. Obviously, offensive football has changed. It's harder on defense right now than maybe it's been in a long, long time. But the process is the process, and that's the things I talked about earlier in terms of physical and mental toughness, relentless effort, dominate your opponent, and do your job. It's just simple principles. Schematically, we have a defense that can put pressure on the offense. We have a lot of moving parts, and it's just knowing your job and doing your job. Now, a couple of groups he highlighted. One, the defensive line. He said, right now we're early in fall practice, but they've worked really hard in the summer as a D-line group. We have talent there. They're very coachable. We've got some guys that are developing leadership in that room. Still a work in progress, but we have the talent. As far as the secondary, Steele said they have a lot of versatility back there. He said it's very early, but things are starting to come together there in the secondary as well. So it would be interesting to see that Alabama defense, how different it looks with Kevin Steele running things this year. Meanwhile, over at Texas A&M, Bobby Petrino speaking with the media on Sunday at A&M's Fall Camp Media Day. And Petrino, of course, asked about working with Jimbo Fisher and clarifying what his role will be. Petrino said, look, I worked for Coach Fisher. This is his program. I'm very, very impressed, and that's part of one of the reasons why I came here, because of my knowledge of how he runs a program. It's my job to make sure I'm working hard every day it's been fun. I can tell you that. It's been enjoyable because he has such a great offensive mind. Now, since Petrino got hired, a lot of people have been asking, who's going to call the plays? Are you going to butt heads with Jimbo? What happens if he wants to overrule you? All that kind of stuff. Petrino said, look, it's a collective effort. I've been calling the plays in practice, and I will continue to do that. A lot of times, the calls are made throughout the week. 
And we've heard Jimbo say that, that they're going to work collectively. They'll put together the game plan throughout the week. Uh, of course, Paterno added, you have to be able to be disciplined to be able to do what you did in practice. He was also asked, are you going to be on the press box or the sidelines throughout the season? He said, I haven't made that complete decision yet, but I'm leaning toward the press box. When I was a coordinator, I was up mostly up there. He said um, his decision will likely be uh, based on his quarterbacks. He said, it's going to come down to how comfortable I am with the temperament of the quarterbacks, where I'll be. But it's sounding like Petrino will be up in the press box. Probably a good idea. If he and Jimbo butt heads, you want that happening on the headset, not on the sidelines in front of everybody. So, uh, yeah, if I'm Petrino, I'd take my uh, play calling duties up to the booth and uh, let Jimbo handle all the stuff going on down on the sidelines. A few other notes on Texas A&M. Jimbo Fisher talking with the media and confirmed uh, news regarding one of his staffers, Joe Schaefer is going to be promoted uh, from defensive analyst to assistant coach. He will coach the secondary, work primarily with the safeties and nickel corners, uh, filling a spot on the staff that was previously held by Terry Price. Uh, Aggie secondary is pretty good last year. Led the SEC in passing yards allowed at just 156 per game. Uh, did give up a lot in the run game, so a lot of room and improvement there for the Aggies this season, but Again, easy one to start off. They'll open September 2nd against New Mexico. Over Kentucky, Mark Stoops announcing on Friday that uh, they're going to hit on the offensive line as O-lineman Nick Hall going to be sidelined for the entire season. Stoops said Nick suffered an injury. I think he's going to have to take a medical red shirt. There's another tackle that had some promise but had an injury. He's going to have a hard time coming back from that. Uh, he's a Texas native, was a three-star, number 46 offensive tackle in the class of 2022. Uh, and Stoops has made some significant moves there on that offensive line this offseason. Obviously, it starts with the offensive coordinator moving on from Rich Gangarello and bringing back Liam Cohen, who was there just two years ago. But the O-line, a big focus in the transfer portal, and they added a lot of pieces. Obviously, they added Marquez Cox uh, from Northern Illinois, Cortland Ford from Southern Cal. Mark Stoops said, much needed, no denying that. We needed the depth, we needed length, bodies, much needed. They're all playing good. I think it's going to take a little time to develop the chemistry. I know we're improved, but to our standard, I don't know. Uh, lastly, Stoops said that Liam Cohen has that energy. He said, I don't want to put any and all problems on a previous coach from a year ago. That was on me. We felt short there. Uh, a lot of them are within the program, and I shoulder that. But with Liam, he brings an energy and a confidence about him. And obviously, it speaks for itself. Go look at that Kentucky offense from two seasons ago. Lastly, Ray Davis, running back, coming over from Vanderbilt and the transfer portal. He met with the media on Friday, said, look, uh, had a great performance last year at Vanderbilt playing against Kentucky. So it was a good day, good game with the previous team I was with. But right now, we're trying to focus on getting a W here come September 2nd. Davis uh, trying to establish himself in that running back room. Said he strives to be a leader, being consistent. He said, I just got to be the best person I can be on and off the field. My peers look at me not just at a football, as a football player, but as a young man. And that's what I got to do to separate myself. Just be myself every day and know that that will translate when I'm on the field. And over at Auburn, the uh, – Auburn Tigers on the practice field the last couple days. Just a quick note on their starting wide receivers. Day one and day two of fall camp. Starting wide receivers were Camden Brown, Jay Fair, and Nick Mardner. I uh, don't know if we're going to read anything too deep into that, but first couple days, same guys running with the ones. Amari Kelly, Javarius Johnson, and Malcolm Johnson were the receivers that went with the second group. And then you had some other guys like Shane Hooks, Jair Shorter, and Caleb Burton. Of course, Jair Shorter and Caleb Burton coming in through the transfer portal. So, uh, and Shorter was dealing with an injury, so uh, that he's coming back from. So, both those guys in the mix. We'll see. Obviously, starting quarterback, a lot of focus there. Peyton Thorne was with the ones on day one. Robbie Ashford with the threes. But as Hugh Free said, don't read anything into that. We are going to rotate them. And uh, no huge takeaways there from uh, quarterback there, battle there at Auburn. But a lot of people do believe that Peyton Thorne is going to eventually be named and win that job. Thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Coming up next, 
the latest from a busy recruiting weekend in the SEC. That's coming your way in just a sec. First, I want to remind you this episode is presented to you by friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. Look, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's why you got to go check out LinkedIn Jobs. They're helping you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's real simple. You just go to their website, you post your job, and you add the purple hashtag for hiring frame onto your LinkedIn profile. That's going to spread the word that you're hiring. It's going to give you access to some simple tools like screening questions. They're going to make it easy for you to focus on the people with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you want to interview and hire. It is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus their leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs, helping you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Go post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college go post your job for free terms and conditions apply Run along here locked on sec thank you guys for making locked on sec your first listen every day Shout out to our everydayers checking us out every day. Tomorrow on the show, we'll continue with more notes going on from around camp. We're going to start a little bit of our preview series as well. Uh, we're going to do a full SEC preview with a lot of our locked on uh, SEC hosts. So make sure you're checking that out. That's coming to you this week right here on Locked On SEC. All right, let's dive back into it. Plenty to uh, continue to discuss going on around the conference. And we start with recruiting. Yeah, there was a lot going on over the weekend. And some big names make it some decisions. We start over at Georgia as Nate Frazier leaving the West Coast of California for Georgia. He's a blue chip running back out of California, had a ton of offers from a ton of schools, including Oregon, AM, Alabama. He announced live on YouTube he's committed to Kirby Smart and the Georgia Bulldogs. He is a modern day uh, kid, five foot 11, 208 pounds, rate a four star. Running back, the number four running back in the 24-7 sports composite, number four recruit out of the state of California, and the number 51 prospect overall in the class of 2024. He's made multiple visits this offseason to Georgia, and now the Bulldogs have, well, they already had the number one recruiting class, still the number one recruiting class, 27 commitments in the class of 2024. Just a ridiculous class that Kirby Smart's putting together, and Oh, yeah, by the way, they're going for a three-peat in, a, <laughs> in winning a national championship, and they're crushing and recruiting. It's just good news on top of good news for Georgia. Over at Auburn, Hugh Freeze continue to build up a nice recruiting class there. Jalewis Solomon announcing his commitment over the weekend. A lot of people thought he might be going to South Carolina. In fact, many of the experts had predictions that Solomon was heading to Play for the Gamecocks. But on Saturday, he announced his commitment to Auburn. He's a Georgia native, six foot one, 185 pounds. 24 7 Sports Composite has him as a four star, the number 19 athlete in the country, the number 30 recruit in the state of Georgia, number 230 prospect overall. He's listed as an athlete, but a lot of people expect he's going to end up in the defensive backfield. He was recruited by Zach Etheridge. There at Auburn and uh, had a ton of scholarship offers, but that puts Auburn now with 15 commitments in the class of 2024. Four star Joe Lewis Solomon heading to Auburn. Now, there was some not so great news for Auburn and for Georgia, for that matter. On, sun on Saturday night, big time commitment KJ Bolden made his announcement, and a lot of people thought Auburn was building a lot of momentum with him. Some people thought he might just stay at home and go to Georgia. Saturday night, he surprised a lot of people. K.J. Bolden, uh, the top-ranked safety in the nation, picked the Florida State Seminoles. Six foot one, 185 pounds, currently rated as the seventh-best player nationally in the 24-7 sports composite ranking. Had offers from Auburn, Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, and he picked Florida State. So uh, he's heading to the ACC, not the SEC, but a lot of Auburn fans were hoping that they could get K.J. Bolden. He will be... A Florida State Seminole. Well, we'll see. Still time to flip. Could change his mind in the process. We'll see what happens. Over at Alabama, 
Amari Jefferson committed to Alabama over the weekend. Six foot tall, 195 pounds. He is a four-star recruit, the number three recruit from the state of Tennessee, the number 16 athlete, and the number 209 prospect overall for the class of 2024. And uh, he, like you said, picked Alabama over the likes of Tennessee and Georgia. With uh, Amari Jefferson now committed, Bama's at 15 commitments for the class of 2024, ranked number nine overall. And, of course, uh, Bama's got plenty of room to keep adding here, and we expect they will. But uh, a nice get there from Nick Saban and crew over at LSU. Brian Kelly adding a piece to his class over the weekend. A four-star wide receiver, Jelani Watkins from the Houston area. Chose LSU over the likes of Texas, Texas A&M, and Nebraska. He's the number 176 player overall, the number 26 wide receiver. He's the number 32 player from the state of Texas. Small guy, five foot nine, 160 pounds. Took an official visit to Baton Rouge before he made his decision. Got track speed, though. That's what Brian Kelly and LSU like about him. Probably a candidate to be a return man or you know, play in the slot, that sort of thing. But uh, yet another. I think LSU's already got like three receivers signed in that class of 2024. But their commitment's now up to 22 and uh, sits number 11 nationally in the 24-7 sports composite rankings. Over at Ole Miss. Lane Kiffin doing some work over the weekend. They beat out uh, the likes of Arizona and Baylor to pick up a three-star tight end, Dylan Hip, on Sunday. He's six foot six, two hundred forty pounds from the Scottsdale area of Arizona, and uh, had an offer offers from a ton of schools. He becomes Ole Miss's nineteenth commitment in the class of twenty twenty four. They also have another three-star tight end in Cameron Clark, and. Uh, Rated the number 45 tight end, number 15 player out of the state of Arizona is Dylan Hip. Also, Ole Miss picked up a couple other commitments over the weekend. One from three-star wide receiver Sanfrisco McGee and another from Oregon State running back transfer Jam Griffin. Uh, Jam Griffin will be playing for his third school since he came into the college football world in 2019. He was a four-star running back. In 2019, at first committed to Georgia Tech before he went to Oregon State. He will have two seasons of eligibility remaining. Uh, could be a compliment there with Quinchon Judkins and Ulysses Bentley. Uh, Griffin is a graduate transfer, entered the portal just a week ago. And uh, again, San, Fr San Frisco, San Frisco McGee, great name there, coming in the class of 2024 at wide receiver. Kiffin has added. A few late prospects in this group with uh, Clemson transfer T.J. Dudley, Miami transfer Chris Graves, and now the uh, running back in Jam Griffin. Uh, Ole Miss also made a uh, – uh, their class is now up to 18 commits. I believe that's where they are for 2024, uh, but picking up a couple commitments there over the weekend. All right, there you have it. That's the latest going on in – Kind of a combo of recruiting and a little transfer portal news as well. Thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Coming up next, we're going to touch on conference realignment, expansion, movement, selling out, whatever you want to call it. We'll touch on that coming your way in just a second. along here a locked on sec thank you guys so much for making us your first listen every day again shout out to our everydayers come back to check us out every single day plenty to discuss on a daily basis when it comes to the sec so of course we appreciate you guys for joining us but uh right here i wanted to switch gears and talk we'll, we'll talk a little on the sec but we're going to kind of expand a little bit to the world of college football because for those of you who are weren't keeping track, weren't keeping track, whatever. Some big stuff happening uh, really on Friday and then into the weekend of movement around the world of college football. And, and to start off, the Big Ten. Uh, the Big Ten decided that they wanted to start expanding and adding more pieces. And we already knew USC and UCLA were planning to come over in 2024. Well, the Pac-12 could not get their stuff together uh, they were trying to get together on a, on a new TV rights deal. Obviously, CBS, NBC, ESPN, 
uh, really Disney Network with SEC Network and everything else, uh, they couldn't come to any agreements with any of those. And so it sounded like they were settling for an Apple TV deal, which, look, no problem with streaming services, but if you're telling me I got to go get an Apple TV subscription to watch West Coast games, I'm not interested unless I went to any of those schools. So uh, scared off some of the schools out there. They weren't happy with the revenue share. It wasn't enough. And so a lot of people decided to jump ship. And the first two were Oregon and Washington. They officially announced on Friday they are joining the Pac-12 along with USC and UCLA heading to the Big Ten in 2024. So if you look at where the Pac-12 is now, that's going to be – they're at 14. Uh, it'll bring them to, what, 16, 18? I can't keep track anymore. None of these conferences make any sense, and, and we're still calling them the Big Ten. Uh, but regardless, we're going to add Oregon and Washington. Look, I stand by Greg Sankey. He was on with us a few weeks ago, said any conference expansion – it's got to make, make at least a little sense when it comes to geographically where schools are located. This makes no sense, um, especially when you could say, I mean, look, the UCLA, USC barely made sense, but now to add the Pacific West Coast with Washington and Oregon, those four schools playing each other, obviously they're fine. They were all just in the Pac-12. So those make a little bit of sense, but... Maryland, Rutgers, and Penn State having to travel literally across three time zones to the West Coast to go play those schools. They'll make you work in football. I know a lot of football teams, they travel with their, their uh, equipment truck, leaves early in the week and hits the road and brings all their equipment and pads and everything that they need. But what happens to the other school, the other programs like baseball and softball and track and field? <laughs> It just makes it very inconvenient for those schools and uh, or those sports. And again, nobody really cares about that. It's football. That's the straw that stirs the drink, but going to inconvenience a lot of people and put a lot of people out. Uh, Washington Athletic Director Jennifer Cohen said uh, joining the Big Ten is important for the school's long term stability. So we have tremendous respect and gratitude for the Pac 12, its history and traditions. At the same time, the college landscape has changed drastically in recent years. The Big Ten's history of athletic and academic success, long-term stability, best positions our school and our teams for future success. Oregon President John Carl Schultz said Friday that the Ducks and Washington will receive a partial share of the Big Ten's media revenue. So they're not even getting a full share. They're getting a partial share of the media revenue upon entering the deal. They're expected to become full-share members when they negotiate their next TV deal in 2030. Unbelievable. Uh, on the other side, the Big 12 said, oh, you're poaching? We'll go poaching. The Big 12 officially announced their addition of Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah. This comes on the heels of adding Colorado a week ago. Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark made the announcement Friday that we're thrilled to welcome Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah to the Big 12. The conference is gaining three premier institutions, both academically and athletically. And the entire Big 12 looks forward to working alongside their presidents, 80s, student athletes, and administrators. So here's the weird part for the Big 12 is this year, they play one more season with Oklahoma and Texas in the conference. They also welcome their four new schools in Cincinnati, UCF, BYU, and Houston. Uh, in 2024, Texas and Oklahoma, of course, will leave. They'll come over here to the SEC. But that's when the Big 12 will add Arizona, Colorado, Arizona State, and Utah. It's hard to keep up with, man. It, it's uh, I don't like it. Um, change is, is difficult for a lot of people. But, again, to me, the bigger issue here is the um, what happens to the other sports. Again, you know. Uh, going have, going from Morgantown, West Virginia, all the way out to Phoenix, Arizona, or Utah. It um, it, it's going to make for some weird, uncomfortable travel for some of those, like we said, softball, baseball, track and field, uh, swimming and diving, whatever sports your school has. Um, you know, sports where kids' parents could easily come and visit. Not so much anymore. A uh, few more notes on this. Pac-12 
currently left standing with four teams, Stanford, Cal, Washington State, and Oregon State. No idea where they go from here. Um, there is some thought that maybe the they could merge with the Mountain West and form a conference there, but Pac-12, you're done. I mean, you were thought to be in that group of five, but Pac-12 will not be in that group of five much longer anymore. Uh, and that automatic playoff bid that kicks in for, you know, when we go to the expanded playoff next year, you guys think Pac-12 is going to lose their automatic bid in that, especially if you don't even have enough teams to form a conference. Uh, Tim Brando put out an interesting tweet. He said, the bottom line, all this realignment is, uh, in the end, the school presidents and athletic directors could not handle a TV deal that was Apple-centric. That's what the Pac-12 was offering to their schools. He said, linear TV is still king, and college football has never been more popular and more lucrative for TV networks. The ESPNs, the NBCs, the CBSs, the Foxes, those are all the ones who rule the day. Uh, Oregon State Athletic Director Scott Barnes felt bad for him. He said, look, conference realignment just doesn't make sense anymore. What the enterprise was built on was regionality and rivalries, and that's gone. That's the case for many of these leagues. For the SEC, it still makes sense. Texas and Oklahoma are still very much in the SEC footprint. Texas not far from Texas A&M. Uh, Oklahoma not very far from Fayetteville, Arkansas. You're still very much in the footprint. Pac-12 put out a statement said, today's news, incredibly disappointing for student athletes, fans, alumni, and staff of the Pac-12 who cherish the over 100-year history, tradition, and rivalry of the Conference of Champions. We remain focused on securing the best possible future for each of our member universities. Um, yeah, Pac-12, there is no future. You're done. Uh, even if you merge with the Mountain West, nobody's beating down your door to come get those uh, tickets or watch your sports. So it's unfortunate, man. Um, as Cole Kublik pointed out, he said, look, eight of the Pac-12 teams will leave to more revenue under their new media rights deal than they would have by staying under the new deal that was proposed. It's just an insane reality of where we are in the world of college football. A few short decades ago, TV money built the Power Five as we know it. This week, the pursuit of TV money has driven schools to kill that structure they built. That was a, a tweet from front office sports, and I thought it was pretty poignant. Um Big question now turns to what should the SEC do next? Uh, Nick Saban spoke on it over the weekend. He said there's a lot of traditions that we've had a long time in college football. I think we're in a time of evolution for whatever reasons. Some of those traditions are going to get pushed by the wayside, and I think it's sad. Whether it's good, bad, or indifferent for college football, I guess you have to define what's good and bad for college football. I just hope we keep in mind all the choices and decisions we make relative to what we do in college athletes. athletics is the student athlete. They're here to get an education. I want to try to help them develop careers on and off the field. And hopefully some of the choices and decisions we make for college athletics in the future will impact them in a positive way. Uh, lastly, Eli Drinkwitz over at Missouri. I really thought what he had to say was, was again, pretty poignant and on point. Drinkwitz saying over the weekend, uh, I thought the transfer portal window was closed. Oh, that's just for the student athletes, I guess. The adults in the room can do whatever they want. It was a tremendous comment from Eli Drinkwood saying, yeah, we're, we're going to put all these restrictions on people. By the way, we got Congress people in D.C. right now trying to propose restrictions on NIL. Oh, you can't you can do this, but you can't do this. Uh, yet. The conferences can just willy nilly overnight go, oh, you know what? We're uh, or schools can say we're leaving this conference for this conference. No heads up. Just we're going to do a by, fly by the seat of our pants. And I get it. It's money motivating factor in a lot of this stuff, but. Sad for a lot of schools, uh, a lot of students out there that, um, you know, let's say you grew up in in the Oregon area and you uh, wanted to play for Oregon basketball or baseball, and now your parents can't come see you play when you have to go play Rutger, at Rutgers, at Penn State, at Illinois. Not exactly a, a car ride right down the street. And to me, that's the bigger thing, the biggest thing that that makes uh, most nonsense with this is. If you can't drive there, like that's what makes the SEC great is almost everything is least is within relative driving distance. Look, when Florida has to play at Oklahoma, I get it. That's not exactly a, a spin around the block. But when Auburn has to play at Alabama or at South Carolina or at Georgia or at LSU, it's all, you know, one day car rides. It's, it's day of you can make the trip. I know some people who've woken up in Baton Rouge in the morning on a Saturday and drove up to Auburn for a game that day. And drove back that night. 
not the best uh, form of travel, but it, it's doable. Um, now you're making it where plane rides, flights, that's what you have to do. Let's say you're a diehard Washington fan. You want to go see your team play in, in the Big Ten? Plane rides for, every, for almost all the games outside of the few remaining Pac-12 teams that are going to the Big Ten. So, again, I'm not the biggest fan of it. I get it. It's money motivates all, and, and but at some point we got to step back and say this doesn't make sense. And we're going to lose rivalries. We're going to lose the Apple Cup. We're going to lose, um, you know, all the great rivalries that that made the Pac-12 with them breaking up. Oregon, Oregon State out the window now. Uh, it's sad, man. It's where we are in in uh, college football, and uh, that is going to do it for this edition of. Locked on SEC. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen every day. Again, shout out to our everydayers. Keep checking back with us every day. We've got some great content for you. More notes from around the SEC and fall camps throughout this week. So make sure you come back and check in with us. I'm Chris Gordy. This has been Locked on SEC. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.